Previously on Hainai, a journalist from the 60s seeks out the truth of the supernatural occurrences in Toronto, and his findings may become more useful to Mary and the gang than previously thought. A harmless Halloween party becomes a true horror fest, led by a dangerous puppet. Now, Mary deals with her powerlessness to save everyone under her protection, and her friends Donner, Murphy, Laura, Ashvin, and Evelyn might have to pick up the pieces as she grieves. You're listening to Hainai by Motsi Dapo. Episode 32 Alala Alala I... I wouldn't make something up like this. I know about the show. I know about the woman who saved us. You've mentioned her before. My friend and I thought that, well, if we could tell anyone about this, it it would be you. And and then you went AWOL for a while. I'm sorry. It's okay. We were all on edge. Did, uh, something happen? Something like that. But we're not here to talk about me. I know what the official reports say. But a lot of it doesn't add up. So if you could share what you saw, that would be a huge help. Yeah, okay. But you need to keep an open mind. Because nothing I saw made sense. I mean, vivid hallucinations aren't a usual side of gas leaks. But maybe this was something else? (sighs) I I know it might not seem like it, but I'm a skeptic. Or, I I was. I mean, I still am. But, there's a difference between being skeptical and just straight up being in complete denial. And I'm not that kind of guy. (laughs) What I saw down there. Here's the thing. I know they took the bodies away before anyone could take a good real look at them, but enough people were around to see that those deaths weren't at all from inhaling too much gas. One guy's skull was cracked like an egg, for Christ's sake. That just doesn't happen. And it's not something you could just... forget about. Honestly, I'd think I was crazy if... My friend wasn't there with me. She's... She's in a bad way. We both are. But we needed to get this out. And I know how much reach your show has. And if the news isn't going to talk about this, then... Unless we both imagined everything... That's possible too, I guess. Maybe we're just crazy. Well, if you are, then so am I. So I can't judge. Anyway, I get the feeling this whole city's gone crazy. So we're all in good company. Hey, listeners. This is DJ at the Dark. I know you've all been wondering where I've been. I stopped taking calls for a while there. For my... safety. Now, while level with you all, I know my audience. I know you all have different opinions about what my show is. I know a lot of you are true believers. Or open-minded. 
but I also know that a lot of you are skeptics. You can't even begin to believe the stuff I talk about here. Or my callers talk about. You'd just like to hear a little ghost story. Have a good laugh about it. Maybe you like hearing me talk? Put this on in the background. I'm pretty sure some of y'all fall asleep to the show. Which, honestly, I'm happy to take as a compliment. It's comforting, I guess, to hear about these terrifying things and know for sure that they aren't real. But I'll give you a little peek behind the curtain here, because I've spent the last few weeks fearing for my life and hiding out because I know that it is real. At least, some of it is. I was almost killed by something, or someone. I was almost killed in my own studio. And I saw these awful things. But if you asked me to explain everything I saw, I couldn't even begin to describe. <laughs> Isn't it ironic? This is literally my job. To describe the horrifying things I'm told. But I couldn't even begin to describe what I saw. Let me start from the beginning. I was taking a call from a listener. I like talking to my The listeners. usual. He was talking about his ghostly husband. You know, he's How right there now. had been this disturbance in his home after he passed away. How he'd been given peace by a woman. Short. Brown skin. Black hair. Wore these pendants. If you've listened to my show long enough, this will probably sound familiar to you. Someone in this city gaining this reputation for helping in terrifying situations. Often accompanied by others. A couple of whom were described as plain clothes police. Anyway, we were just chatting in the studio, doing our thing, when we started getting this interference. Hello? Our equipment Anyone on there? Fritz. Then the lights going out. Then I saw them. Reflections in the studio's glass. Impossible horrible shadows? So completely inhuman that I was afraid to look at them. Which might have saved me, now that I think back. The caller on the phone. He told me not to look behind me. Whatever you do, DJ, don't told me his husband, his dead husband, warned him. I think at one point I heard that man's voice. I know. It sounds like a prank, right? I thought it was. It crossed my mind more than once that night. That somehow, these callers were playing some kind of prank on me. That I was part of some show that my one assistant producer was in on it. Pretended to be on vacation or hired someone to do the damn thing. But even though all that, I did what I was told. I didn't look behind me, because I could hear them. I could see them in my phone camera, and I could feel them. Something brushing against my leg. That 
pressure you feel in the air when something's nearby. Cloying air. And the smell. Like someone died in there. In the few seconds I hadn't been paying attention. Whatever it was, haunting or a prank or something else, it was real. And I was terrified. The caller. He was afraid for me too. Said he'd call someone to help me. Because somehow he knew exactly the situation I was in. Probably heard the terror in my voice. Or whatever his husband had to say to him from beyond. You all know my stance on the supernatural. I am... Well, I was... A skeptic believer. I believed there were things in this world we couldn't understand. And I wanted to learn everything I could about them. But I was rational enough to know that most of these things could very easily be explained. And I loved it when people gave their explanations. When we all worked towards an answer that we couldn't get to individually. But more than anything, I wanted to share people's experiences. Show them they weren't alone. Either in the stories they told or the experiences they had that they couldn't explain. That's why I'm here now. Because I don't want you to be alone. If you know what I know. So, I tried to find my way out of the studio without looking behind me. Hard, but doable. I used my phone cam, and my friend the caller got me in touch with someone he said could help me. He said she'd come get me. Come help me. Seemed like she knew exactly what she was doing, given the instructions my caller friend was relaying. And here's the thing, listeners. I know she knew what she was doing. Because when I met her... When I met her... I met a woman. Short. Brown skin. Black hair. Pendants that she wore around her neck. It was her. The one I'd been hearing about from some of our Toronto listeners. Our very own recurring character. And she was there for me when I needed her most. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The caller stayed on the phone with me, even though half the time I could hardly understand him with the interference I was getting over the phone. When I got out of my studio and into the hall, there was nobody there, which wasn't so unusual. I record late, and the space I rent isn't like a high-rise in the financial district. It's always been quiet. I'm not sure if I want to go back there. At least, not alone. But I might have to. With the number of calls I've been getting. God, I always wonder why my listeners keep going on tangents. But now that I'm the one telling the story... Anyway, hallway, phone camera, I saw these horrible things on the ceiling, black, roiling things, a splash of red I could barely see, that almost looked like a hand. I was alone, in the dark, 
what felt like dozens, no, maybe hundreds of things that I couldn't recognize. But it felt like they'd jump on me if I made one wrong move. The caller stayed on the line with me, assuring me it would be okay. And then, something happened. My call was cut off. There was an interference. A change. The air shifted somehow. Something was... wrong. Well... wronger. When the caller came back, he sounded clearer. No more interference. No more static. He told me I'd be okay. Told me to go to the elevator. I was going to do it. But I could hear... Audio feedback. Whispering. This layer of sound under his voice. Warning me not to listen. Then suddenly, things got as staticky and nearly inaudible as before. My friend on the phone told me he'd been cut off. That he'd been out for about a minute. That minute when he sounded clear as day, telling me to go to the elevator. Telling me it would all be okay. I didn't know what to believe. I was confused. Scared out of my mind. And someone, or something, was playing mind games on me. Huh. The more I think about it, the more I think about how close I got to not surviving. I don't know how many of you have felt that more than I realized, I think. <clears throat> Eventually, Mary got on the call. DJ? Well, can you hear me? kind of. Barely. My How caller, are you doing that? an older man, as I mentioned, put his cell phone up to the telephone receiver so I could hear her instructions. It was a whole thing. Her voice. The way she talked, she was so sure. I was still terrified out of my mind, but she knew exactly what I had to do, and all I had to do was follow her lead, and it helped. It helped a lot. Mary told me to recite something, a chant or a prayer or something to protect me. In Tagalog, because we were both Filipino. I don't know how that works. I never grew up with these prayers, these names she was praying to. But it felt like I'd fallen into the ocean, and her prayers were someone throwing me a rope to grab onto before I drowned in choppy waters. I went back to my studio on her word. The elevator was apparently unsafe, and I didn't want to lose signal and drop the call in the stairwell, my only lifeline at that time. I lost it anyway. Someone came into the room with me, from seemingly nowhere. Um, man? I closed my eyes. I didn't want to see. But I could feel it. I could feel all of it. Everything shifting closer and closer. Breaths on the back of my neck. Things crawling over my feet. Able to touch me when they weren't before. Strange music playing, even with 
all the power out. Coming from speakers that felt decades older than what we had. I felt a hand on my shoulder. And then another hand on my other shoulder. Someone kneeling in front of me. Then a hand on my head. Like I was a child. Being soothed. Being told off. So gently. I heard a voice. A man's voice. Sounded English. His voice was so gentle. So comforting. Someone I didn't know. He seemed so kind. But what he was asking me to do? He wanted me dead. The words he spoke, even the way he said them, sounded like someone who saw me as nothing more than a child or a pet so far below him barely worth his time to be pitied but hardly considered he encouraged me told me it wasn't my fault if i just opened my eyes let go. But then, I heard it. Movement. The moaning and groaning of things that were hardly human, but suddenly scared. Cringing away from something. Like they knew what I didn't. That something, or someone, was coming. And these things that wanted to get me were as afraid as I was. The hands on me pulled away. The man, or whatever had the gentle voice of a man, seemed annoyed, like he'd been interrupted in his task. I could barely hear it with our studio soundproofing. But I thought I could hear the elevator. So quiet. So far away. Open on my floor. This pressure around me. This weight. It lifted. The things that touched me the way those hands did. Heavier and heavier on my body. Began to pull away. The smell wasn't overwhelming anymore. I didn't feel... trapped. This could have been a mistake. I could have died, I think, if I had done it even a moment earlier. But I opened my eyes. In that final moment, in the dark, I saw it. A man, standing at the door. A red hand, like the one I'd seen in the hallway. Right above his head. For a moment, I was blinded by the light of the hallway when the door opened. But when I looked again, the man was... Well, he was gone. All of it was gone, like a bad dream. And in front of me, Mary, the woman. Brown skin, black hair, short, pendants around her neck. She'd come for me, and I was, I was safe. 
I survived. There were bruises. On my shoulders where the man, I think it was a man, gripped me. Something like a burn marking my head. I was showing signs of fatigue, and the doctor asked me if I had been experiencing insomnia. When I asked why, he said my condition was similar to people who hadn't slept in days. You all know I said I'd be taking a break. Mm, indefinitely. To recover. But... <sighs> then I started getting these calls. You all know about the dollhouse incident. There was a party, and according to local news, a gas leak. And, well, people died. But I've been getting all these calls from people who were at that party. Told me it wasn't a gas leak. Some of them took videos. Most of them were up on the main floor where the fire alarm went off, and the sprinklers got them out quick. A couple of them were down below, where those people died. In the basement, two different people called me, weeks apart, telling me they wanted to talk about exactly what happened down there, how it absolutely was not a gas leak. And both of them mentioned her. The woman, Mari. I'm telling this story because I think it needs to be told. And I think you all know, Toronto isn't the way it was. Or maybe it's always been like this. And... We all just started seeing the cracks. Welcome. <laughs> I don't know why you've come here, but... Grab a seat. The show's about to begin. It's his favorite. She dreamed about dancing with him here. It was a nice dream, so I kept it around. No, I wouldn't think it makes sense. I know you're confused. Quite frankly, I'm confused. I don't know how you wandered in here. But, now that you're here, would you like me to sing you a song? Or maybe, tell you a story? A story, yes, I can do that. Let me think. Once upon a time, there was a woman, like the sun. She was nearly engulfed in darkness, nearly killed in an apartment stairwell. Nearly eaten by a horrible, rotting thing. Oh? Not that kind of story. Fine, let's think. Hmm. 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 Once upon a time, there was a young girl. She was tall for her age. Always was. She lived with a loving family who was just a little too overbearing. So, when she was old enough, she wanted to move into the city. Go somewhere and be someone all her own. She moved into the apartment building that purported to be luxury, but was suspiciously cheap to rent. Don't look at the two-star rating. Don't look at the quick turnover. It's at the heart of Toronto. It's downtown. 
It's so different from where she grew up, the center of everything. What felt like the whole world. Hundreds more people in one city block than in her entire town. And she was no coward. She was brave. Brave new place. Brave new world. This girl, this woman, liked to make clothes. Trawl vintage stores. Beyond the struggle of her teenage years, nothing in her life had ever been truly difficult or frightening. So when the rotting thing came for her, she didn't know what to do. She thought she would die. All she could do was run. <laughs> okay, okay, fine. I'll figure out a different story. No need to get violent. Let's see. Once upon a time, there was a boy, a child with stars in his eyes, who lived in a world that was full of possibilities, and parents who adored him, told him he was special, and he carried that with him, as well as his parents' tools, when they visited different places, attended to different beliefs, his parents taking power from the land that was shared between its many peoples. All religions have superstition, after all, even if they do not live in harmony. Which is a nice way of saying that extremism does not suffer peace when all it wants is control. So, speaking out against these groups, they who feel racism and division in their home, they who abide by the Hindutva ideology, would invite retaliation. When they were gone, disappeared, and he was alone. Well, he still told people he was special. He made it a business model. He never forgot what they taught him. He used it. He mocked it. He was kind, but he didn't let them see that. He was loving, but he hid that away behind handsome smiles and false promises, distractions and pretty lies. But by the time he found someone to love, well, he found that his lover was much, much worse. This is the story of a boy, a boy who came from a family who loved him, but not as much as they expected from him. And he was a quiet boy, well-behaved, never spoke out of turn. He did everything he was asked, and he did it well. As he grew, it was clear how handsome he would grow up to be and his family knew that he, out of all of them, would achieve the most in his life. Get a great, high-paying job, move up the ranks, get rich, find a nice girl, get married, buy a nice house, and keep their riches and prestige in the family. Those were their dreams, and the quiet, obedient, handsome boy never asked for more. Until he did, though he didn't really ask. He just was. And eventually, they figured out what he was. He'd done so much for them, so he figured it wouldn't be so bad to let them know. As far as he was concerned, they owed him that much. After everything he did for them, after everything he gave them, but Faye didn't see it that way. So he left, and he came to the city, but the city isn't kind 
if you don't have anyone to rely on. And for a while, he didn't have anyone to rely on. Until he found someone. Or someone found him. And he had someone to owe again. But that's between them. Oh, this is a good one. Listen in. Once upon a time, there was a boy in love. The boy was quiet, intelligent, and afraid. And the one he loved was bright, vibrant, and brave, and... And then... He found something. Can you guess what it was? That's right. Oh, for and the poor boy, he didn't know what was going on. Even to the end, he didn't know. Not when the one he loved dragged him into a ramshackle house, once burned. Not when he lost him in endless, silent halls, where the pale white feet of a child stood at the top of the stairs, and things without eyes watched him around the corner of every long corridor. And he hummed the song his nan loved most, to comfort himself as he walked alone. He wasn't alone for long. The one he loved found him, asked if he wanted them to be together. Forever. Skin to skin. Heart to heart. Fused as one. For nobody understood him as well as the boy who loved him. And there was nothing he wanted more than to be understood. But this wasn't the love the boy dreamed of. It was a horrifying, corrupt thing, and it turned love into fear, knitting skin so that it hurt to part even when the boy wanted to run. And he couldn't run. But the boy, he... He survived. Rather, he was saved by a faceless, nameless man. Though the boy, he... He knows that man's name. Remembers his face. Why wouldn't he? Just because everyone else was affected by this man's most powerful spell? Just because his name and his face slips away from everyone else's memory? How do I know this, you ask? Well, I know them. I know you. And time and memory are like a membrane through which this dream, osmosis, for we are, all of us, connected. In more ways than one. <sighs> one more story before you wake up. Once upon a time, there was an infant who died. Wait, 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 let me try again. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a young girl surrounded by death. It happened often enough in her life that she thought she might be cursed if her mother didn't know better. But she lived her life, and went to school, and fell in love, and helped her mother. And then death touched her family. Her grandmother died, then... Then... 
her father. And then she started seeing death everywhere. Every other day, in the news, a family friend, a cousin's classmate, a friend's father, shot on the street, in a car, murdered in their homes while they slept, bodies on the streets and canals, heads wrapped in duct tape and plastic bags, signs written on cardboard, voices on TV saying it was right and just and correct and the killer should be protected, even when blood covered the floors and infants were shot in their beds and... She wanted to do something. Anything. And she tried. Oh, did she try. And her mother was furious. Would hardly let her out of the house those last days. Before she... It was her fault. It was her fault. It was her fault. It was her fault. Was her fault. <laughs> or so the story goes. Oh, sorry, baby. It's time for you to wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Laura, wake up. Laura, wake up. Detective Donner! Oh my god! Evelyn? What's going on? I found it. It took me weeks and, oh my god, a lot of caffeine. But I found it. Found what? It's a book. It's the book. Remember those tapes I shared with you with Elaine and her friend and Hyde and- I, I remember. The journalist, Jay. So, I started sorting through everything Elaine owned that was donated to the library. Everything. And it took a while. And I learned a lot about her life after Hyde. And honestly, I'm glad she had a good life after everything she went through, but... Alright, focus up, Evelyn. Jay wrote a book. He wrote a book about all the elders he knew about. He left it to Elaine before he disappeared. And I know where she hid it. You're listening to... Hi Nai. By Motsi Dapul. Crimes of the Marcuses. In 2022, Ferdinand Marcus Jr. was announced the new president during the May presidential election under questionable circumstances. As you know now, Ferdinand Bongbong Marcus Jr. is the son of the late dictator Ferdinand Marcus Sr., who ushered in one of the Philippines' darkest eras called the Martial Law, which saw the death, torture, and unexplained disappearances of thousands of Filipinos. Under his one-man rule, the country was pushed into staggering depth and poverty that it has yet to recover from, and the injustices of the time are yet to be answered for. Yet, instead of using his power to rectify his father's wrongs, Bongbong Marcos and his administration has been doing quite the opposite. His running mate and current vice president, Sara Duterte, daughter of iron-fisted former president Rodrigo Duterte, was also named as the secretary of the Department of Education. So far in her term, she has been under fire for using Filipino taxes in confidential funds amounting to 650 million Philippine pesos for reasons she staunchly refused to be transparent about, despite the money belonging to the Filipino people. More insidious, however, is the department's move to remove the name of Marcos in the term Dictatura Marcos or Dictator Marcos in the Grade 6 Araling Panlipunan or Social Studies program of the new Matatag curriculum, an obvious ploy to subtly usher in a new age of disinformation 
that can threaten to wash away the crimes of martial law. This decision was backed with vague excuses by House Appropriations Vice Chair Maria Carmen Zamora, unable to explain why they were erasing the dictator's name from educational record in order to clean up the corrupt, kleptocratic family's image. Hey everyone, this is Reg Hilly, co-creator and co-producer of High and I. And do I have some big news that we're starting off these credits with? We are now officially part of the Rusty Quill Network. And this is pretty appropriate because this podcast wouldn't exist without their flagship original series, The Magnus Archives. We are so honored to be counted among some of the most amazing podcasts currently active, and we hope you enjoy the rest of Season 1, Act 3, starting with this episode that you just listened to. This episode was written and directed by Motsi Dapul, who also plays the role of Other Mary. The role of DJ in the Dark was played by Yoyi Halago, the role of Survivor 7 is played by Woxy, H.C. The role of Evelyn Y. is played by Natalie, and the role of Donner is played by Leanne Johnson. To help support the production of High Night, you can buy us a milk tea at coffee, or subscribe to our Coffee Gold at coffee.com slash highnightpod. That's ko-fi.com slash highnightpod. Or you can subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash highnightpod. Starting today, we're implementing early access episodes on our Patreon, so, if you're a Patreon subscriber, you can get High Night episodes three days earlier than the public release. We'll be dropping early access episodes on Thursdays every two weeks at 9 p.m. EST, right before the usual Sunday releases, along with other bonuses and behind the scenes content. High Night is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all other podcast listening platforms. Check out our YouTube channel for a monthly special live stream of the creators, too, where you can get to watch us play some fun games, tell zany stories, or just overall have a good time. Don't forget to follow us on our official blog, highnightpod.tumblr.com, for more news and updates, and also on our socials, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, at highnightpod. Leave a rating and review when you check us out. High Night is a podcast produced by Motsi Dapol, Yoi Halago, and me, and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution non-commercial share like 4.0 international license. And with that, thank you, we love you, and hanggang sa muli.